Okay. Very good. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, okay, well, hopefully you can see these slides. So this is a little outline just of what I'll talk about. Um, we're we're going to look at the rules and the judging criteria. Uh, then we will have the presentations. Um, after the presentations, our judges will leave the room and deliberate. During that time, we'll have a people's choice vote for the best presentation, and we'll take question and answer from both the Zoom and the live audience uh, to any of the participants. And finally, when the judges are ready, they'll come back and uh, declare the winners. Um, so what's this competition? It stands for three minutes uh, presentation of someone's thesis. And you will have exactly three minutes to speak about your research. Um, and we're interested to hear about it, I think, uh, because we know there's a lot of great research going on across all of our departments. And the three minute competition is a great way to um, cultivate and demonstrate uh, people's presentation skills. So we're going to be offering some prizes today uh, for the competitors first prize and runner up uh, based on the judges votes and the separate people's choice prize which will based on uh, be based on any uh, anyone from the audience can vote. Um, I wanted to say a little about our judges who are all alums of CSE. Uh, first, Paul Vygansky, uh, who's, a, who's a grad of computer science. Am I getting a feedback there? Yeah. Sorry. Um, and he's received both, well, bachelor's, master's, and PhDs from the U of M. Um, He's kind of a serial entrepreneur and has been involved with many companies currently, um, or most recently Packet Power, where he's the founder and CTO. And um, this company um, is an IoT platform uh, where they manufacture wireless power and environmental monitors, for example, for use in data centers around the world. Um, the second judge is Charles Lowe, um, who is a grad, uh, bachelor's and master's from mechanical engineering, uh, later received an MBA from the Carlson School, and Charles had a long career with TSI Incorporated, which is a local company specializing in measurement instrumentation, covering a very wide range of industries. Um, including scientific research, manufacturing, uh, and things like aerosol monitoring, which have been very important uh, during the COVID time. Um, and finally, we have Cecilia Tuin, who is a grad of aerospace engineering, bachelor's and master's degree. She later did her PhD at University of Cambridge uh, but came back to Minnesota where she's working for Delta Airlines. Uh, she's a principal engineer and she's currently director of airworthiness um, for process and compliance at Delta Airlines. And uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, and taking part in this competition. So here are the rules of the competition. Each participant is allowed one single static PowerPoint slide. Uh, they have a three minute maximum for speaking, which we will monitor with this clock. And it needs to be spoken only, no singing or rapping, or for example, recitation of poems. And the way we're gonna run the clock, just so everyone knows is, when you're ready and you start speaking, then we will start the clock. Uh, and should the clock run out, I think it's gonna make some noise uh, and you should stop speaking immediately. 
Um, and our last rule is just that the decision of the judges is, is the final decision. Um, what about the judging criteria? You can see that there are a lot of criteria, but they fall within two main categories, uh, comprehension and content, um, which include things like addressing background and significance of the research, uh, clearly describing the impact and giving a logical presentation. At the same time, you'll be judged on engagement and communication. Um, did the audience wanna know more? And did the presenter convey enthusiasm for the research uh, and capture the audience's attention? Uh, and did the slide enhance the oral presentation? Okay, so we're gonna have a series of 15 contestants. And I should say that the winner or the first prize today will advance to the University of Minnesota wide competition that includes any other colleges that have entered. The winner of that competition is allowed to advance to a national competition. Uh, and I think I said this already, the people's choice voting will be after we finish all presentations, at which time we'll also have Q and A. So I think we're ready to start. Um, and I'm gonna move off to the side and our first competitor can come up. Uh, and when you're ready, then I'm gonna switch the slide. And when you start speaking, Bill Johnson will start the clock. So our first competitor is Margaret Clapham from the Department of Chemistry. I want everyone to take a second. Notice the chair you're sitting on and the ground beneath your feet. It feels pretty solid, pretty stable, right? But what if I told you that everything is constantly shaking? These, uh, everything is constantly shaking. Everything is made of atoms and molecules that are constantly moving and vibrating. These vibrations are just so small that we can't actually see or feel them. I study these vibrations in a class of solids called organic crystals. Crystals are considered a highly ordered solid because the molecules within the crystal are arranged in a repeating pattern. And not just the molecules have this repeating pattern, but the vibrations of these molecules have a repeating pattern too. My research focuses on the pattern of these vibrations in a class of organic crystals called rubrines. Rubrine is one of the best organic materials at transporting energy, which makes them really useful in devices like solar cells, which collect energy from the sun and transport it to devices that we can use. The problem is that rubrine has three different crystal patterns and they all transport energy differently. Only one of these crystal patterns can actually transport energy well enough to be used in devices. This makes it really important to be able to distinguish between these different crystal patterns. So when we look at these actual crystal patterns, they all kind of look the same to the human eye. So I decided to develop a method to take pictures of these different crystal patterns using the crystal vibrations. Think of these crystal vibrations like a surfer riding a wave. This wave is propelling the surfer forward. And if you wanna know where the surfer is going, you look at what type of wave they're riding. It's the same for my rubric molecules. If you want, you, by looking at the vibrations of the molecules within the crystal, we can look at how the energy is surfing through the material. This means that crystals with different vibrations are going to transport energy differently. Using lasers and a technique called Raman spectroscopy, I was able to find a unique vibration in the crystal pattern with good energy transport. In my new method, I can scan a laser across all these different crystal patterns and be able to look for that unique vibration, marking the areas where this vibration appears. This allows me to create a picture where I can separate between the different crystal patterns and count the number of crystals that can be used in energy devices and distinguish them from the crystals that can't. This has already been useful for me in finding and identifying crystal patterns of rubric and is ready to be used in new energy materials. This, by looking at this new method, we can quickly identify these crystal vibrations and identify new energy materials. This is going to help speed the development in fields such as solar energy and solar cells. That's a pretty big impact, all from these small, nearly invisible vibrations. Thank you.
next talk will be given by Christine, who is from bioinformatics and top computational biology. The purpose of my research is to maximize the health of our dairy cattle and the quality of milk that they produce. So what is the problem? Why am I doing this? The problem is that there's this disease, it's called mastitis, and it's caused by specific microbes, so things like bacteria, that gain entry into a part of the cow's body that is responsible for producing milk. Once there, these microbes reproduce and release toxins that damage the integrity of the udder and the overall health and well being of the, the animal. So, why is this problem important? Well, this problem is important for two main reasons. First, as consumers of milk, mastitis is important because it has a negative impact on some of the things that we have come to know and love about milk its taste, its texture, and the feeling in our mouths. And second, mastitis is a problem because it's an animal health issue that results in increased pain and swelling of the udder and sometimes even death. So why is this problem hard? This problem is hard because it's been around for so long and we still haven't found a solution. We've tried to prime the cow's immune system with vaccines, similar to what's being done with our immune systems to fight COVID. But this is challenging because Mastitis isn't caused by a single microbe. There's multiple microbes that can cause this disease as well. We've tried using things like antibiotics, but this is used for treating sick animals when we much rather focus on preventing the disease. And finally, we've tried ensuring proper hygiene, not just for the people working with these animals, but for the cows themselves. And despite the use of these tools, and the positive impact they have had on reducing the frequency of this disease, mastitis continues to remain a problem. So what might be the solution? The solution might be the very thing that causes this disease, bacteria. We now know that each of the four teats attached to the other house a diverse community of bacteria, what we call the teat microbiome. The teat microbiome acts as a barrier preventing invasion of the udder by the very microbes that cause this disease. But who are they? What are they doing? Do cows that get mastitis have a teat microbiome that differs from those cows that don't? This is the main question that I'm trying to answer with my research. And I'm really excited about it because it's opening up doors for approaching this problem in new ways, using new tools, both molecular and computational, and bringing together a diverse group of scientists trained in different fields. Okay, the next talk will be given by Ame Joshi, who is from the Department of Mechanical Engineering. As a scientist, we want to study human body, cure diseases, and make human lives better. Let's say we want to develop some new drug like COVID vaccine, and we want that drug as soon as possible. But developing a drug, testing it, bringing it to the market, it's a long process. It takes time. Also, in the beginning phase of the drug development, we can't even test all these drugs on human body. So what do we do? We turn towards model organisms. There are several model organisms like monkeys, mice, zebrafish, and even small tiny fruit fly. We use these model organisms to understand the potential effect of these drugs on human body. But to do all of that, scientists need to introduce external substances like drug compounds, DNAs, RNAs, proteins into the small cells of these model organisms at their embryonic stage. And that's where microinjection comes into picture. Microinjection is a technique which helps us to do so using fine tipped glass pipette. It is a technique which is similar to normal injection, but at microscopic level, which can't be seen through naked eye. 
That's why operator needs to have high level of skills and hundreds of hours of practice to master it, which eventually slow down the biological research. Robots. Robots has always enabled human to automate such a hard, tedious task, which require high level of control and precision at microscopic level. In my research, I'm developing one such a robot which automates the whole microinjection procedure. This robot is built of off-the-shelf, commonly used component, which can be easily found. This robot contains series of cameras to image the model organism. That imaging is combined with computer vision algorithms to detect where the injection needs to be performed. And based on that data, robot finally performs the microinjection. This robot allows the degree of control and precision in all aspects of the process, which would have been impossible to do it manually. One cool thing about this robot is it is so generalized that by adding small amount of data and one training model, same robot can be used for any other model organism for various applications like cryopreservation, CRISPR, IVF, and of course, drug discovery and many other applications. That's why this robot allows to perform truly large scale experiments. I know in future, this robot will open up the research opportunities that have been never explored before. If, if this robot leads to accelerating biological research by one day and save one human life, then I would say I'll be the happiest person on that day. Thank you. The next talk will be given by Tan Tan, who is from Industrial and Systems Engineering. I always hate waiting in line. How about you? Imagine you are heading to a busy coffee shop for your morning coffee and seeing a long line waiting ahead of you. At this moment, I want to ask you, what do you care about the most? Uh, what do you care about the, 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 the most? Sorry, I can, I can do it. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, sorry, I cannot do it. Uh, maybe I should quit. So, so sorry about that. Keep going. Uh, I cannot finish. Sorry about that. Next talk will be Kishore Kunal from Electrical Engineering. How many of you are on social media? I guess everyone. We humans are social animals. We connect with different people, build relationships, and form groups such as friends, family, colleagues, or the CUMNCSE group. Social media websites like Facebook allow us to connect virtually and store this information as graphs, where each individual is stored as a node of the graph and the connections between them are stored as edges of the graph. These websites have learned how to give you proper friend recommendations or advertisements based on your interests and the groups you are part of. My research endeavor is to provide similar suggestions to design analog devices. Analog devices are everywhere. Your cars, phones, speakers, you name it. These devices are made of tiny transistors which are connected in a particular order to realize different circuits such as amplifiers, mixers, or filters. Guess what? These circuits can also be represented as graphs. So my objective is to understand the relationships between these graphs based on their connections to place these transistors in a manner and give you the best performance. 
but like your group of friends may not be same as my group of friends there is not a single type of amplifier here this is one one of the more than 2000 types of amplifiers and many new designs are being constructed each and every day i'm sure you have observed this difference in your real life have you observed that the same ed sheer music sound different on the headphones versus on a speaker this is due to different amplifiers inside them but despite these differences fundamentally the graph structures have common features to identify the amplifiers inside bigger circuits i use graph neural networks which can understand the relationships between these graphs using this approach we can reduce the time to make these devices and improve their performance so that you do not have to wait one year for your next power pack iphone thank you all right the next speaker will be jiyong li from civil engineering Uh, this uh, the beautiful image on the left shows the mouth of uh, Mississippi River in Louisiana, where the river meets the ocean. We call this region Delta, and this place is our home for many animals, plants, and humans. But unfortunately, these Delta regions have been disappearing around the world. For example, this Mississippi River Delta has lost about 70% of its land area since 1932. Uh, there are many reasons for this land loss, such as sea level rise or subsidence, but one of the important reasons is poor river management. A good example would be dams constructed in upstream of rivers, which can trap sand and decrease sand supply to these delta regions. Uh, so to, to, better, to better understand what is happening and what will happen to this earth surface in the future, it is important to monitor how much sand is available and how it travels in rivers. The figures on the right show you an example of major river bathymetry. As you can see, there exist various sizes of sand waves. Uh, for example, there are small sand waves on top of large sand waves. And these large sand waves are marked with red dashed lines. Uh, those sand waves are found to present different behaviors depending on their sizes, and they carry sand downstream of the rivers. Such multi-scale geometries and scale dependent behaviors of these sand waves make it extremely hard for us to monitor how much sand travels in, in, in rivers. Uh, for this region, our estimation on sediment transport in rivers can be easily off by orders of magnitudes. So my PhD thesis focuses on how those various sizes of sand waves behave differently and how they carry sand in, in rivers. Uh, during my PhD, I developed a sand wave tracking algorithm to quantify their characteristics and how they, uh, I'm currently developing a mathematical model to estimate how much sand is transported in rivers using spectral analysis. Uh, I expect my work uh, will help uh, improve our understanding on fundamental earth surface processes. And also my work can be used to build practical guidelines for monitoring how much sand uh, is in the river. Uh, for example, how long or uh, where we should monitor its movement. And lastly, uh, my work can be also contribute to monitoring uh, human impacts on riverine systems and also uh, evaluating the landscape sustainability. Thanks for listening. share the screen to present the screen instead of showing the outline some of the stuff will cover oh i think we can't change now okay thanks the next talk will be given by kevin lynn uh who is in bioinformatics and computational biology imagine that we can discover how a drug precisely works the same way we use fingerprints to find a person of interest. 
Except at this particular crime scene, instead of finding out who is the killer, we're trying to figure out what is the target of the struggle. Now, if you were the lead investigator on this crime scene, would you want to sit there and manually sift through millions of fingerprint profiles just to, just to uh, find a match? I know I wouldn't. Believe it or not, this is how the current drug discovery process works. You have to screen hundreds and thousands of chemical compounds, which can take up to 15 years. It can cost up to $2.6 billion just to have one drug hit the market. This process is so incredibly time inefficient and costly that it ultimately leads to unaffordable drug prices for you and me. Now, my research aims to solve this problem by borrowing the concept behind fingerprint matching. With fingerprints, we can extract key features such as loops, whorls, and ridges and, uh, and represent this information as a profile. Then we can use a computer algorithm to quickly find a matching profile pattern to a large database of fingerprint profiles to identify the culprit. Now, analogously, we can form these profiles for drugs of interest. To do this, we set up an experiment in the lab using the tool called CRISPR, which is a gene editing technology that allows us to quickly make the gene deletions one at a time. Now, by measuring the response of each of these gene deletions to a drug, we can create a genetic profile for that drug. Just like a database, built for, uh, just like a database where fingerprint profiles are already established for potential culprits, our research group has established a database of genetic profiles for potential drug targets. Computationally, my work focuses on discovering that algorithm to quickly match a drug to its gene target using these genetic profiles as fingerprints. Now we have tested this method on a set of well-characterized drugs, and we have confirmed that this method recovers each drug's uh, expected target. Armed with this knowledge, my new experimental and computational approach can be potentially used for all existing chemical compounds, particularly those with unknown targets. Now, the same way we can efficiently find the killer using a fingerprint is the same way that we can find the target for hundreds of thousands of compounds at scale. This one-size-fits-all fingerprinting approach represents a paradigm shift, one that can save billions of dollars and millions of lives by accelerating drug discovery. Thank you. Next, uh, the next talk will be given by Yaling Yu from Mechanical Engineering. The Earth is hit with 173,000 terawatts of energy from the sun continuously. That's 10,000 times more power than the entire world consumes. To utilize it, one of the most commonly used technology is solar photovoltaics. Solar panel systems for homes and businesses are increasing rapidly in popularity. However, what about applying solar panels for greenhouses? Imagine a greenhouse with solar panels covering nearly all over the roof. Plants inside would cry because solar panels cannot let light in. To solve this problem, our research group is working on transparent solar panels, luminescent solar concentrators. How can they be transparent? Let's start with their mechanism. Luminescent solar concentrator we are working on are large glasses coated with nanocrystal polymer composites. These nanocrystals, called quantum dots, can absorb part of shorter wavelength of sunlight while letting the rest pass through. These quantum dots then re-emit the luminescence in longer wavelength, which are guided along with the glass to the peripheral solar cell that convert them into electricity. My work is to synthesize silicon quantum dots, fabricate silicon quantum dot luminescent solar concentrator, and evaluate their efficiency. Using our recipe, we found silicon luminescent solar concentrator can achieve a pretty low levelized cost of energy, only 1.6 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, let's return to the plants in greenhouse. Research has shown Blue lights will inhibit plant cell elongation. 
which makes plants unhappy. Well, the red light is required for plant growth. So having a tunable transmission spectrum is beneficial for greenhouse application. To achieve it, we collaborated with Dr. Vivian's group, added another coating layer with cadmiumcinite, cadmium sulfide compound dots onto the silicon compound dots coating layer. Because different compound dots have different absorption spectrum, this bilayer luminescent solar concentrator has a strong ability to control the sunlight spectrum passing through it. After our efforts, plants would smile in a solar powered greenhouse. Hopefully, in the future, luminescent solar concentrator roof will be widely, widely applied for greenhouses, not only generating clean energy, but also increasing crop yield. I'm looking forward to that day. Thank you. Next talk will be given by Fatima Mufra from Industrial and Systems Engineering. My research is about solving a seller's problem who has a network of products and wants to know what price they should set for this product in order to have the maximum revenue. But what is a network product? A network product means the product is more valuable when more people buy or use that product. For example, social media platforms or video games. First, we notice that it is not a good a strategy to consider a network product as a regular product and use those pricing solutions in the literature. Second, we notice that it is not an optimal strategy to set a single price for all of our customers and offer that product for that price to all of our customers. Instead, we need to divide all of our customers into different groups based on their ages, their genders, the place they live and et cetera. And then we offer the product with different prices to different groups of customers. So we modeled our pricing problem for such a product and we consider multiple segments of customers into our model and the revenue improved. And we also concluded that considering that we have network effects or popularity in our model, and also that we have different groups of customers, the revenue, their revenue will be improved by 70%. Thank you so much. The next talk will be given by Dini Babalmenko from Material Science and Engineering. What I do for my thesis project is study something that is probably in your pocket right now and then use this knowledge to advance the field of molecular electronics. So, what is molecular electronics? Here you see an OLED display, solar panel, they're slim flexible and efficient. And uh, this is a very well established field. And OLED, which is molecular electronic device, uh, is there's a 40% chance that it's in your pocket because 40% of the smartphones sold in 2021 had an OLED display. But what if I tell you that there's still very important and useful lessons that can be learned from an OLED? Uh, although this is a very well established technology. One of the uncovered mysteries about an OLED is the impact of molecular alignment on its performance. Well, this sounds like a very specific question. Answering this question 
may actually not only help design better OLEDs, but also can be extended to solar cells or maybe even come up to a new device design. So think of an individual molecule as a small battery. It has a positive and a negative end. When all these small batteries align in an OLED, we have an OLED that also has a positive and a negative end. So we thought, well, this must have some kind of an impact on its performance. And it turns out that it does. But unfortunately, this impact is negative. So when all the molecules are aligned, it actually disturbs light generation and your OLED is not as bright as it could have been. So then we develop ways to manipulate this molecular alignment to make this device brighter. And that was done by changing some processing conditions. So now we have two things. We have a good understanding of how molecular alignment impacts electronic device. And second, we have ways to actually manipulate this alignment, do what we want it to do. So using just these two things, how can we truly make an impact in the field? Luckily, molecular alignment is not always a bad thing as it is for OLEDs. Uh, there's some devices actually where it's advantageous to have them all aligned. For example, this device uses vibrational energy from the surroundings to harvest energy. So what we can do is using our knowledge that we develop from OLEDs, make them all align, harvest even more energy. And this is just one example. The possibilities are truly endless. You can potentially have a sheet of aligned molecules used as a mechanical sensor. So now you have electronic devices, not only in our pockets, but also on our floors, which is great. So to summarize, my thesis trying to, is trying to understand uh, molecular alignment and its impact on device performance, and then use this understanding to improve devices. In my free time, I love watching. Okay, sorry. 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 <laughs> Having trouble with dancing. There you go. Sorry. So I can start, right? <laughs> In my free time, I love watching TV series and movies. So once in an episode from Grey's Anatomy, I had watched a character named Derek Shepard, a renowned neurosurgeon, perform a breathtaking brain surgery. It involved implantation of electrical electrodes in the brain of a violinist while he was awake and playing the violin all while during the surgery. Apparently, this risk-taking surgery saved the violinist his career in music. Otherwise, he would have been left paralyzed for the rest of his life, suffering from an epileptic stroke. But did you know these electrical electrodes, once implanted in your brain, the health cannot be monitored externally and non-invasively using an MRI scan? More importantly, once these electrodes are implanted in the brain, they are in direct electrochemical contact with the brain tissues. This causes implant corrosion, and the patients with these implants need to undergo an implant replacement surgery every two years. In my doctoral study, I am designing magnetic micro devices to be used as potential implantable treatment options for such neurological disorders. Basically, I'm designing coils or inductors that are micrometer in size on flexible substrate. If you remember your high school physics classes, you must have learned the Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. If you pass current through these coils, they generate magnetic field, which in turn induces an electric field on any conductive material. In my case, these micrometer sized coils are inducing this electric field on the biological conductor, the brain. Extensive numerical modeling and experiments on rodent brains have shown that these microcoils on flexible substrates can activate the brain at the single cell resolution. They are MRI safe. And since we're using the induced electric field to activate the brain, there is no such direct electrochemical contact with the brain tissues. So this causes the implants to be less prone to corrosion. Moral of the story, if the violinist in Derek Shepard's surgery would be implanted by one of the magnetic micro devices that I have designed, he wouldn't have to undergo an implant replacement surgery again in two years, 
and the health of the implant within his brain could have been monitored externally and non-invasively using an MRI scan. Thank you. Next speaker will be Ming Feng Chang, a civil engineer. Have you ever experienced a sudden slowdown or stop while driving on highway, even though there's no bottleneck or traffic accident? If yes, you are experiencing a famous traffic phenomenon called phantom traffic jam. Phantom traffic jam is an emerging property of traffic flow due to driver's driving behaviors. Such behaviors will also decrease the traffic throughput and increase fuel consumption and emissions. Nowadays, we are more interested in automated vehicles. And we are curious about how will increase vehicle autonomy reduce traffic jams. Typically, we categorize with uh, fully automated vehicles and partially automated vehicles. So fully automated vehicles are those driver-free and controlled by computers. However, partially automated vehicles are similar to human-driven vehicles, but they can adapt their speed automatically uh, to keep a safe distance with the preceding vehicle. We also call those partially automated vehicles adaptive cruise control ACC vehicles. And ACC vehicles are now commercially available in the market. Previously, research find that fully automated vehicles can improve the traffic flow. However, it is still unclear that how partially automated vehicles impact the traffic flow. To answer this question, we build with high fidelity models and simulate in a highway environment. Surprisingly, the results find that compared with pure human-driven traffic flow, involving with a number of automated vehicle, ACC vehicles, for example, 40% ACC vehicles, it will incur more and faster traffic oscillation, oscillations. And it will even in, uh, decrease the throughput and uh, increase the fuel consumption and emissions. So therefore, we can conclude that the mixed traffic of ACC vehicles and human driven vehicles will negatively impact the traffic flow. Are you discouraged from buying an ACC vehicle? Don't be disappointed. Out of our research, let us understand ACC driving behavior as well. And it, it also helps us build next generation control for the mixed traffic of ACC vehicles and human driven vehicles. And in, uh, such as rapid metering technologies to maximum the throughput and minimize the fuel consumption and emissions. So enjoy your ACC vehicles in the near future. Thank you. talk will be given by Mayank Tanwar from Chemical Engineering. Good evening, everyone. Catalyst are materials that increase the rates of chemical reaction while maintaining their own identity. Our human body has lots of enzymes, which are biological catalysts that carry out different chemical transformations in our daily lives. As you can see here, when we take a drug substrate in our body, some of these enzymes are responsible to metabolize them. As we can see in the picture, the enzymes come in, both the enzymes and the drug substrates have specific sites on them through which they interact. So they interact together and then the enzymes leave generating a drug metabolite in this process. So why is understanding this process important? One of the biggest challenges of the 21st century is to develop drug molecules for targeted application. Something we all have seen in the current ongoing pandemic. One of the critical steps in the process of drug discovery is to be able to synthesize the drug metabolites. Why? Because we want to know once we take a certain drug molecule into our body, what kind of products are formed in our body and whether the metabolites that are formed by the action of the enzymes are harmful to our body or not. Now, as you can see here, enzymes are complex molecules. Biological catalysts are complex molecules that themselves are very difficult to make. 
Hence, getting the drug metabolites from the enzymes is already difficult. So we want to turn to mediators, which are catalysts driven by electricity, hence electrocatalyst. And the big picture question that we want to ask is, can, can we design mediators, which are first of all, easier to make, second, reactive, and most importantly, can mimic the same role enzymes play in our body in a chemical laboratory. Now, how do we do this process? So what we did in my research was to first understand the complete mechanism of metabolism and the properties on the enzymes that are responsible for these metabolism. More specifically, how this metabolism occurs is when we take a drug substrate into our body, the enzymes break selective carbon hydrogen bonds of that drug molecule and instead put oxygen in the place of hydrogen. So what we used are quantum chemistry based calculations with the advancement in the quantum chemistry, we are able to reliably see the properties of mediators. My research saved some hundreds of hours of experiments and by understanding the whole process and the properties, we screened hundreds of mediators to potentially get mediator candidates for our work. And at the end of my research, we have been able to get a very excellent class of mediator for the first time in this field that were reported, which gives very excellent performance and are at par with the enzymes. And this work has already been published in the Journal of the American Chemical Society. And my ongoing work is on developing new mediators to get uh, drug metabolites, which will save potential human lives. Thank you. Next talk will be given by Arish Benkarachalapati. It's okay. Second. Here we go. Hey, folks. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Hey folks, I would like to introduce you to my cat, Luna over here. Doesn't she look so pretty in this photo? Um, I especially love this like really intricate black and orange fur that she has all over her body. It's very characteristic for a tortoise shell cat. If you've ever wondered why that happens, it's because of this phenomenon called genetic noise. Basically, uh, being genetically female, Luna has two X chromosomes, each of which has a gene that codes for a different color, either black or orange, and they tend to switch on and off in a random way, which we call genetic noise. Um, to kind of give you a more intuitive understanding of what is happening, if you can imagine all of her hair cells as balls that are rolling down a landscape, they can either end up in this valley where the fur is black or end up in the valley where the fur is orange or switch between the two with genetic noise. Um, this results in a very intricate, complex and unique pattern even for cats that are genetically identical, for example, twins or clones. Unfortunately, this very thing that makes her so pretty is what leads to the survival of cancer cells after chemotherapy. And these cells, given enough time, eventually recur, uh, especially in the context of breast cancer. There are currently 3.8 million women in the US alone who have a history of breast cancer, and about 40% of them are expected to recur. So how is my thesis looking at this problem? We're trying to define the energy landscape uh, that underlies the tumor cells. And in addition to that, we're trying to design therapies, both through different drug combinations, as well as treatment schedules, to see if we can bias the entire landscape towards tumor cell death instead of letting some of them survive. Uh, for example, one of the exciting results that we found was much like, you know, um, a conductor leading a choir, or like, for example, the Pied Piper of Hamlin leading the rats out of the city, if you can add the specific chemotherapeutic drug to cancer cells periodically at a frequency that matches the natural pulsing frequency of a specific protein, you can synchronize all of the cells within the Petri dish and induce cell death in them. Um, currently, my work focuses on trying to 
uh, trying to map the landscapes under different conditions that are relevant within the human body, and also trying to figure out treatments that uh, would work within those contexts. If there's one thing that I would leave you with is that genetic noise is very pervasive and is a consequential thing in biology. As you can see, it can be pretty, it can be super terrible, but by understanding this, we can gain a more holistic understanding of biological systems as well as develop better therapies. Thank you. Thank you. So we have one more talk given by Valentin Eben, and he's going to present it remotely. I'm not quite sure how we're going to switch here. Valentin, you can go ahead and screen share. All right. Slide. He's going to show it. Okay. <clears throat> uh, can you see it? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? <coughs> uh, can I go on? Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dean Longmire, and thank you to everyone um, uh, for joining. If I were to ask you to divide uh, the Roman numeral CX, as in Charlie X-ray, by V, as in Valentine, and you are lucky to have an 11-year-old who has just been taught the Roman numerals in their sixth grade math class, they might tell you that the Roman numeral C represents the number 100, X, the number 10, and V, the number 5 thus transforming the problem into 110 divided by five. This is more than a change to a different numerical system. It also makes available the mathematical machinery of long division, which is not available in Roman numerals. This anecdote illustrates the underlying project of the field of scientific computation, which is to solve problems in the domain of science and engineering by representing systems in these domains as computerized mathematical models and using the mathematical machinery in these models to gain understanding and insights about uh, this representation of this system. For, for example, recently in the field of AI, a particular kind of algorithm that uses graphs to represent um, uh, relational data called deep learning has been very influential. These deep learning algorithms often outperform humans in a handful of complicated tasks, such as voice recognition, machine translation, and image classification. But deep learning has continued to face strong headwinds when it comes to scaling up for, from research to real world applications. A situation made worse by a recent slew of experiments demonstrating the brittle nature of most of the state of the art deep learning um, networks. These experiments essentially trick deep learning alg algorithms to act in erratic ways by feeding them with so called adversarial examples, which are input. Uh, data that contains some small um, magnitude perturbations. Examples include strategically placing a small white and black sticker on a stop sign and successfully deceiving the standard architecture for classifying uh, public signs to misread this, the sign from stop into speed limit 45. These little alterations put the input data beyond the representation space of the algorithm, a condition known as out of order distribution. Several, several efforts are being undertaken in the machine learning community to resolve this problem of catastrophic failure by deep learning systems. And um, our research, what we came up with, um, which my assertion is that a critical cause of this erratic behavior by these graph-based deep learning systems is in their inability to effectively and accurately represent the underlying structure of the complex data in the given system, particularly data with topological hierarchy. While graphs provide a flexible and powerful data abstraction and an impressive collection of graph theory and mathematical methods to analyze the data they represent, graphs have also recently been shown to, oh my God. Was that a stop for me? No? 
Oh, I can't see. Did I just stop or I had Keep a sound? Moment. You can you can stop screen share, yeah. Okay. Oh, I ran out of my time, I see. Ready to go? Ready. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, can we unshare? Would you like can to we go back to our regular screen? Um, so that was our last presentation. And I think now the judges can move to another room where they can talk about their rankings and their decisions. You want to show them? Okay. Next door. And then can we run people's stories? I started. So we have to go to the last or the second to the last slide. Okay. And then the, the link will be on there. So we'd have to go back to our presentation, mm -hmm. the PowerPoint. Sure. Where do you want to go? Control it. I have to advance it. Yeah, where do you want to go? Sorry. Is that the last one? Go here. Or here. Sorry. This one. But you can't see it. Oh, you had it for a second. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Okay. Okay. So um, you can go to this link uh, to vote for the People's Choice Award, where all of our competitors are shown with their first names. Uh, and you can put in your vote. And also, um, if you have questions for any of the speakers, we would be happy to take them. How about, can I just open the chat? Yep, it's good. Okay. Okay, and we can take, Questions via Zoom or from the regular audience? I have a question, a comment. I think the link, the poll might not be open yet. Is anyone else having issues? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 having uh, trouble. Uh, let me get Bill. Okay, she's working on the poll because I guess she lost her connection. So keep, if, if it works for anyone, please let me know. Does it work? Not, yeah. yet. Not yet. I'm going to keep refreshing. Okay. We have somebody who's raised their hand. Yes. So can they talk? Yeah, you can see them in the chat. Um, can you please put your question in chat or comment? That was Palomi. Okay, yeah, let's go to it. Um, but... Uh, 
Gloucester. Below me, you can ask your question if you want to. Okay. How to vote? Good question. Uh, <laughs> still waiting, right? Still waiting. Sorry. We're trying to get that open to everyone. So I guess there was a connectivity problem. Yes. Uh, I have a question for Sangha. Uh, just, uh, I just want to hear what she has prepared without any pressure. Yeah, just to briefly talk about your research. If it is okay with you. Do you want to? Do you want to come up here? Okay, the poll should be open. Tom? Is it working for everyone? Great. Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Um, my question is for Yelling. Okay. Um, I thought your project was super cool. Um, can you see these transparent solar panels applied somewhere else other than greenhouses at all? Oh, yes. Actually, the uh, most wide application for the luminous and solar concentrator is for the future's window because in the urban city, because if you only apply the solar cells in the roof of the buildings, then there, uh, because the aerial is not enough to support the uh, electricity for the whole building. So uh, actually the most common purpose for the luminescent solar computer is for the building's window so they can support the electricity for a whole building in the urban city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so in the chat or the q and I have a couple more questions about voting. It should vote. I'm sorry, it should work now. If I get this off of the screen, if you go to this link. Okay, so I'm getting more people saying they can see the ballot okay from online. So I have a question for Renata, which is how big are your micro devices actually? So the pictures that I said, uh, that I showed over there, they are 190 micrometer by 190 micrometer in area, each color. 
and you think you could just use one coil? Yes, one coil uh, has potentially shown to activate the brain. Uh, it, it's, it's at the cellular level, but I have designed arrays of coils because that's the procedure in which I can make those devices. So it's just easier to make multiple of them, but I can control each coil individually. Thanks. Uh, and follow up on that. So you said you did experiments on rats with those. So when you try to translate it to the human level, do you think you'll have to like increase the size of the device? You have to have multiple ones. How do you think that translation would happen? So if you want to translate to the human, obviously like the mechanical design would, would change. I mean, the contact pads, uh, like the dimensions would change, but the size of the microbial, I would like to keep it the same, but increase the number in an array. Can I ask a question about traffic congestion? Yeah. Uh, is there anything that you would recommend now that a lot of people have these following cruise control settings? Um, what would you recommend to change those so we can decrease kind of the stop and go or the, the traffic jams jamming up yeah so um so currently we have um a, so adaptive cruise control vehicles are currently what we have and many people could, um in nowadays they start to use the adaptive cruise control and they are convenient and um like you um it will save a lot of your energy to to operate that so that's a good thing so uh, we recommend people to use adaptive cruise control uh, technologies. However, their behavior to, to the emergent property of the traffic flow is not as good as we expect. So, um, so th this is our work to do some infra infrastructure related control to help uh, the adaptive cruise control vehicles doesn't behave, um, doesn't behave uh, not as good as they are currently is. So we will improve the, uh, the, the infrastructure or um, regulates the traffic to um, Im improve the, the, the experience. So we still recommend to choose the, uh, uh, to use the autonomous, uh, autonomous system and uh, we will uh, like you know, improve those uh, from our perspective. So do we, do you need to add Kind of noise to the algorithm so you randomize it a bit more uh, um, actually we are still working on that um, it's uh, uh, like regulating like regulating the um, the, the, the percentage the, the portion of the uh, automated vehicles to um, to to facilitate the, the, the traffic jam like that okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I think it seems complicated. It's a frustrating problem. Still some Q and A's. You mean it? Uh, uh, no, those were about voting. Thanks. Yeah. Two people saying they couldn't vote and then one saying, yes, we can vote. And thanks everyone for voting. Um, I can keep asking more questions if no one else wants to. I think there are a lot of interesting Species. Valentine, are you still on? Yes, I am. Um, then, um, long my. Can you hear me? 
Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so with your algorithm, um, what, what will be, uh, let's say the extension of it to generalize it across many problems? Is, is that easy to do? Uh, uh, yes, then the, um, uh, the mathematical machinery that comes with sets is a lot more um, uh, broader in terms of the, um, uh, the representation space than that of graphs. And most of the current algorithms um, uh, that we have in the market, um, including the ones that have been used you know, in um, uh, um, autopilots in machines and including a lot of the algorithms that have failed this um, uh, dramatic um, um, uh, catastrophic failures that we've been seeing in deep learning algorithms are mostly uh, the biggest um, um, representation space that they are using is that of graphs. On the other hand, a graph is essentially just one instance of a particular um, uh, uh, um, uh, equivalence, set, equivalence class of a set. So what um, the algorithm does is that it brings the machinery of sets into the representation space. So it dramatically expands the representation space so that even if you have a situation where an adversarial picture is given to uh, an algorithm that is based off of my, my, um, um, my um, that is built using my algorithm, what would happen typically is that the, 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 the the algorithm will respond in the negative. It would say, well, I haven't seen this, so I don't know what this is, but it will not behave in a catastrophic way of saying like, you know, like what we have been experiencing with deep learning where an algorithm will say, I know 90%, I'm 90% convinced that this is a cat when it is a dog. Or the case of the car that I mentioned where the car basically looks at the sign with the little tricks and it reads the sign as supposedly um, uh, 45 miles per hour area when the sign is simply saying stop, you know. So, so my algorithm will essentially dramatically expand the rep representation space of of algo of um, uh, of um, uh, machine learning algorithms, especially deep learning ones, and avoid this spectacular, this um, uh, erratic behavior that we've been experiencing. Which um, uh, I, I, from my research, it shows that this erratic behavior is less an issue of lack of data because the way some companies have responded to it, especially um, uh, the car companies is to look for more data and try to train this um, uh, algorithms with this new data, this new thing or put adversarial um, uh, networks to fabricate strange data. The problem is that that still does not scale up appropriately to ever increasing situations in real life where yeah. We, we confront different situations. So yeah, so sets really dramatically increase increase the representation space of um, uh, an algorithm in terms of trying to represent the real world data or system that is dealing with. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you. So I've got a question in the chat, which is about the traffic congestion. Does at least part of the problem depend on drivers not being able to adequate, adequately predict or effectively execute uh, when they need to exit, therefore having to cause disruption as they try to cut across lanes too late? That's a complicated question, but I understand it from traffic. <laughs> Did you get it, the question? Um, I think it's really about people cutting across lanes suddenly. Uh, so people are driving along. And some people need to cut across lanes to exit. Yeah, I think I think this is a good question. So, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, the cut in problem, uh, the cut in issue will will cause more uh, traffic oscillations, 
uh, and safety concern. That's a that's a truth, and we um, we think that this is a um, good concern. So um, the cut in problem. Um, actually, we don't consider the cut in uh, issue because cut in is actually a complicated uh, question uh, to 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 uh, to analyze those and to model this. And we um, in this question in our thesis we didn't consider too much about lane changing. Uh, even though lane changing is a, an important case in the in the real world. So, um, however, we will take this. Um, the, the, the cut in problems, uh, we will um, uh, consider in our um, like infrastructure related um, uh, problem to solve this uh, solve, solve this question in the future. And I think that's a good uh, good concern. Thanks. Thanks Thank for you. that. Um, I think I have a couple more here. Uh, see oh, those are still I guess that was just the comment that he thinks you answered his question um, so I guess we're done with that I have another person that interested in Kong Kong's work. Maybe you can ask a specific question. That would be great. So I think they're struggling. <laughs> how long has it been open? How long, is it how long is it open? Well, I think it will be held open until the other decisions are made. And then it will be closed. So we could close it any time. You want to answer a question about sand waves? Yeah. Uh, do you think, what do you think is, uh, are the small waves important compared to the large ones? Yeah, actually, uh, that is the, uh, the, the point I missed in the presentation. I actually prepared it. Um, uh, my recent analysis uh, suggests that these small small scale uh, sand waves are important, actually. So uh, only considering the contribution from the small uh, small sand waves, uh, I was able to um, uh, match a measured value with that prediction. So yeah, and then uh, these small sand waves uh, drive migration of uh, large sand waves, basically. I missed that. <laughs> during the talk <laughs> okay so this the small waves cause the large waves to move yeah yeah i mean it, it might depends on the that's just stress you know if that's just stress is very large i mean the force is very large then it may be uh large sand waves migrate independently uh but with the with the with the data set and analysis I have, uh, it is more, more likely that the small sand waves are driving all the, all the mechanisms I do. 
So does the wavelength depend on the speed and the sand size? Yeah, that's uh, this uh, this correct. Uh, so basically, the sand size kind of determines the size of the wave under the same condition. And the small sand waves move faster than the small uh, large ones. Uh, some right, yeah, yeah, sort of dependency. So if there are microplastics on the bottom of the river, mm. do they move faster than the sand? Uh, <laughs> That's kind of a different question. <laughs> I think it also depends on the density of the plastic and everything and the shape. Uh, it's hard to uh, answer with uh, this one <laughs> sentence. I think we need to consider many, many things. Yeah, I just thought typically they would be less dense. Mm. So maybe they're riding on the top. Yeah. Uh, Question about yes. actually that same thing. So, so, so you mentioned that you know something like seventy percent of the Mississippi River Delta has eroded yeah. over the past what is it, 50, 90 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons I've always heard is because they channel they, they made it into a faster flowing channel, so that it's easier to navigate by ships. But it sounds like you seem to you seem to suggest that capturing sediment upstream in dams mm -hmm. was 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 the primary cause. So, I guess what is the, like the, the main reason for that erosion? Is it because the sediment isn't getting down there, or is yeah. the water flowing flowing too fast and not uh, allowing? It to from flow? my my opinion, the the, the trap sand okay. upstream of the dams are a main uh, cause of losing land area uh, in the delta. I think that the sea level rise also plays important role as well. Uh, but yeah. Okay, well, our judges are back. Uh, what's the status of the people's choice? Should I close it? I think we should close it. All right. Maybe the judges would like to announce the winners. No. I, I should announce or okay. 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 All right. Thank you very much. Um, well, it's my pleasure to announce the winners. And the first prize goes to Yaling Yu. Congratulations. <laughs> Just hang on a minute. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, to Harish. Congratulations. Thank you. And the People's Choice Award goes to Ame Josie.
thanks for your presentations. And uh, Yao Ling will wish you the best in the further competition. Uh, and I'm sure you'll do well against the rest of our university. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Um, thanks everyone for coming and for voting and participating. And also thank you very much to our judges uh, for taking the time to come here and listen to all these presentations. Thank you to the participants too. Yes, and thank all the participants.